Hey everybody and welcome to worship. Um, guess what? We are all worshiping virtual today, so we are glad to be with you. Um, had a little bit of a, a surprise, um, found out uh, yesterday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, that um, we have a staff member that tested positive for COVID and uh, Kathy and I are, have been around them a good bit and as well as some of the other staff. So we're having to go virtual today and um, that's completely uh, okay. We um, have the technology to do that and God's still in charge. So we're going to put this together. We're all going to worship together. It's going to be wonderful. So we are glad that you've tuned in. We know that God has a lot of great things in store for you. So broadcasting right here from my humble abode in my office. So without further ado, we do have some announcements for you. I want you to check those out right now. Hello, I'm Janine, and this is what you need to know. Poinsettia orders are due tomorrow. These benefit music ministries and are displayed throughout the season to be taken home on Christmas Eve. Speaking of Christmas Eve, we are offering a 4 and 6 p.m. traditional service with a modern service at 5 p.m. this year. Sign-ups are live now, so please go ahead and reserve space as soon as you can. These sign-ups can be changed if need be. You can also sign up to use, utilize the nursery, which we are offering at 4 and 5 p.m. services. Next Sunday the 13th, I'll be having a pajama party on Zoom with our kids. It'll be fun and casual with a story and a game, and a great way to interact mask-free. To receive a secure Zoom link, simply email family at rhumc.com. If you already received my Friday emails about kids' worship, you'll get the link that way. Also that day, we'll have a Christmas cantata featuring the adult chancel and bell choirs, which will take place at both 9 and 11 a.m. traditional worship services. We will still have our modern service and children's church at 11 a.m. as well. We will have a church-wide Christmas carol sing-along on Wednesday, December 16th at 6.30 p.m. This event will take the place of our annual variety show, which will be held outside in the side parking lot, weather permitting. Bring a chair and come and enjoy singing all your favorite Christmas songs together. That's all for now, and to reserve a seat, head to rhumc.com. Thank you, Janine. That was very good. Thank you so much for um, listening in. I hope that you will pay attention to emails and the bulletins that are sent out so you know how you can be involved too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue in worship today. Father, we give glory to you. All honor and praise are yours. And we, we just lift up our hearts to you as we pour out um, our love for one another and for you. Lord, fill us this hour in our homes um, virtually, but also in reality. Pour out your Spirit on us this hour, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for joining us in worship. I know today has been a little bit unusual, and um, it is for all of us, but we're grateful that you're with us. You know, this week has been a, a really, really exciting week in the life of the church. I couldn't wait to see you in person, but uh, unfortunately, we can't do that today. This past Wednesday evening, we had, we had a baptism service. We baptized eight souls by immersion. And um, it was a part of a, a special service. It was during the youth time, but we, we invaded their space. Uh, three of those baptized were making their public profession of faith for the very first time. And it was so, it, so exciting. The other five wanted to either remember or rededicate their life to Christ with this bold reminder of dying with Christ and then rising to walk in new life with him. Now, the ages were, were wonderful. It was a span of a fourth grader who had been talking with her parents about wanting to be baptized, and um, all the way up to uh, uh, one of our members who is in his 40s, I think, and um, wanted to celebrate a rededication of life and um, by immersion uh, as, a, as a part of the community. We had a good crowd in the ministry center, and um, if you want to see it, you can go on our YouTube page. It is there, and you can watch the whole service. Jack had a great message he shared just before um, we did the baptismal services. So we, we hope that you'll take advantage of that. But all this prompted a thought and a question in my mind. Do you remember your conversion experience? I mean, do you remember when you were baptized, if you were, um, if you if you don't remember, maybe this is a time to start considering what have I given my heart to Christ? Have I decided to follow Him? Has have have I made that decision to live in the light and walk in the light? You know, you know the question I really want to ask is: Do you remember the resolve you had when you gave your life to Christ? That fresh commitment to Christ. You know, you're going to go out and you're going to share His love and you're going to make a difference in the world. Do you remember that? Um, I know, I know, I remember that, um, and it's fresh. And it seems like throughout my life, there are times where I need to redo that. I need to recommit my life to Christ, and I and I feel sometimes, so, like some people, you feel like you need to be baptized again, but you really didn't know what it meant to be a Christian before. But you know what? Christ meets us along the way. I think it was Peter that said, "I am being saved." Every day, I am saved today, but I am being saved. Tomorrow, I may have a different relationship with Christ and a deeper relationship with Him, and I am being saved again. He continues the transformation in my life. You see, I ask this because it is far too easy for us to fall asleep again after we have been awakened by His Spirit. Um, kind of like hitting the snooze button um, on your alarm clock. Paul wrote um, in Romans 13, verse 11, he wrote, You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. These, these words were written to those who had witnessed, witnessed Jesus in person. They, had, they were right there. They heard his words. They saw the signs and wonders and miracles. They were there when, the, when, he, when he suffered death and resurrection. They were there when the Holy Spirit came on the room at Pentecost. And yet somehow they had drifted off back to sleep and their anticipation of Christ's return, in, in, in the second return. And I wonder, are you there? Is your soul sleepy? Um, when, when we have a sleepy soul, our hearts and our minds can grow hard. Uh, not because we are actively resisting God. It's not because we're obstinate toward God, but because we are not tending the soil of our hearts. Farmers know that fallow ground needs to be turned. It needs to be turned over with a subsoil or something that goes really deep to release those buried nutrients and to break up the hard pan that's on the top that keeps water from, from getting down into the roots. We need to keep the soul of our hearts turned to Jesus and tended with prayer and with worship and with scripture reading. Those things are what keeps the nutrients and the spirit alive in us. Zechariah was a priest in the house of God. And um, he was a priest during a very difficult time being a priest. He, it had been 400 years since uh, God had spoken through a prophet or a priest to the people of God. And I'm sure they were wondering, what's up with that? Like, where are you now? Now, you may remember that Zechariah was married to Elizabeth, and uh, they didn't have any kids because she was barren. Now, it happened... Uh, that Zechariah had a vision from God 
um, the first time in 400 years that God had spoken in a vision. And that, that the vision said that you and your barren wife are going to have a son, and you're going to name him John, and he will, be, he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, which was a magnificent prophet of God, meaning he will be a prophet uh, that will have power and might. And Zechariah didn't believe the angel in the vision. And as a result, he ended up being unable to speak. A forced fast from talking. I don't know how you would do with that. I probably would not do well with not talking at all, ever, or, or for months and months at a time. This silence, though, gave Zechariah a lot of time to listen. Now, I love what J.D. Walt says about the difference between silence and quiet. There's a difference between silence and quiet. He says, silence is the outer reality of a space without sound. Quiet is the inner reality of a heart without noise. You hear the difference? Silence is not a prerequisite for quiet. Even in the midst of the noisiest surroundings, the Holy Spirit can bring us into a deep inner quiet. Zechariah was forced to be speechless for a season because he did not have ears to hear the Word of God. Maybe we can take a cue in this noisy, bustery uh, season to, to find that place of quiet so we can learn to hear God speak too, even in the noise. Maybe it'll be just turning off all the lights except the Christmas tree lights and just reflecting as you looked over that. Find that quiet place where God can speak to you about Him coming the first time and His return the second. You know, when Zechariah and Elizabeth had their baby, when the baby was finally born, everyone turned to Zechariah because that the, the dad was supposed to be the one that names the child. And Zechariah uh, held up a sign that said, His name is John. And right at that moment, his nine months of silence was broken. Now, you fast forward about 30 years from John being born, and we read these words in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's turn the Word of God here in Luke chapter 3, 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, all these notables, all these important people, and then we find the word of God came to a wild man in the wilderness. That's where the word of God came. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, verse 3. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Look at this. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. Man, you know, repentance isn't a word that we often associate with Christmas, is it? But remember, it's not Christmas yet. So what is a baptism of repentance? J.D. Walt again, he explains, Repentance means the alignment of one's life with what matters most. It's a breaking away from, a preparing for, and a running toward. Isn't that amazing? I love it. It's a realignment of one's life to what matters most. That is repentance. It's, it's the awakening of anticipation. Uh, who is it that hears John the Baptist today? Well, it's people who are listening for a word beyond the voices of their own time, beyond the noise of the world that's around them. Um, my devotional this week referred to the Mennonites. 
they are different and how they really choose a different way to live life and, and who they're going to listen to. For instance, when they buy a car or they buy a tractor in this story's case, uh, the first thing they do is they remove the radio. They don't want any voices from the outside influencing them. And so the story I read this week was that the Mennonites uh, came to this person's farm in order to level the land so it could be farmed. Now, that means the, the, uh, the hard, those fallow, sleepy fields were turned. They were then smooth. They were filled. All the rough and ruddy places were smoothed and filled uh, to prepare for the sowing of the crops. You hear those words? Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. The rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All this set, the table setting, we need leveling in our lives. So why do we need leveling? Why do we need the soil of our hearts turned and tended? Here's the reason. It's because the fruit of repentance comes at the end of the process, not at the beginning. Fruit begins with breaking up fallow ground and sowing and cultivating and watering and more cultivating and waiting. And finally, by God's grace, fruit grows or vegetables or whatever you plant. Repentance cannot be reduced to a transition or a transaction at goodwill. It can't be done by a one-time gift or just this one good-hearted thing that we do. It's more than that. Repentance takes sustained attention and effort. It means you have to, to do more. Jesus wants to reach deeper into our lives than just our behavior. He wants to use the power of His Word and Spirit to transform our dispositions and our desires and our affections. I'm wondering, do you hear what I hear? Do you hear the invitation of repentance this Advent season? The invitation to realign your life with what matters most. Maybe this repentance sounds like sharing something that you have uh, more, more than enough to share. Maybe there's a nudge to do or to give something. Maybe that nudge to do or give something is a clue that there's something deeper uh, going on in you. Maybe you have a, a short temper or uncontrollable comfort eating or uh, maybe too much wine. And, and beneath that, there, beneath the surface, there is something that is suggesting that something is broken and it needs redeeming. And that soil needs to be turned. Well, rather than battling the behavior that controls you, why not sow some new seed into your soul? Seed that could grow into very different patterns in your life. And then what if, what if we focus on this one repentance, this one seed that we're planting, this one new pattern in life until this time next year? And you work on building on this. If we, if we would, if we could, I believe we would see fruit worthy of repentance. It would be the evidence of our salvation. It would be the evidence of the transformation in our lives. Your life would gain momentum towards something really good, something, something wonderful. Instead of, you know, instead of thinking of repentance as, as stop, don't, quit, you know, stop doing that, quit doing that, don't do that. Let's think of it in a new meaning, a meaning of go, do, start. Reorienting our highest aspirations toward the best thing imaginable. Philippians 1.9 kind of speaks to this. It says, And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best. Yes, I want to think like God thinks, to have the same mind in me that was in Christ Jesus. How does this happen? By the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. See 
Romans 12, 2. Let's be practical, though. J.D. Walt writes, quoting him a lot today, Your soul or inner life is like a garden. It responds to the law of reaping and sowing just like everything else in the universe. We reap what we sow. We believe that. But here's the tricky part, he says. You sow roses, you reap roses. You sow tomatoes, you reap tomatoes. You sow nothing, you reap nothing, right? No, wrong. You sow nothing, you reap weeds. We didn't even have to plant the weeds, and they're going to grow. You see, this is what Scripture means when it says we, have, we, we are sinful by nature. Is you don't have to plant. If you do nothing for Christ, if you don't do anything to sow righteousness or, or holiness or uh, a mind devoted to Christ, if you do no sowing, the weeds are going to grow. The, the weeds are going to choke out you being able to hear God. They're going to choke out your heart of love for one another and your heart of love for God. If we do nothing, then weeds grow. But repentance means weeding your soul. But even more so, it means sowing the seeds of incredible things. You don't just keep hoeing the ground. You plant the seeds. And you work with them. And you watch them grow. And they grow into a holy and righteous life that is honorable and glorifying to God. So do you hear John's call to repentance? Do you hear the voice of God calling you to better things, to a preferred future with Him. He is calling you, I know He is, to a new advent and a new year full of new fruit for you. Will you respond to His call today? Will you respond and say, Lord, I'm going to sow some new things that help me grow into the person that you desire for me to be? We can do it. Let's do it together. Will you pray with me? Father, your love abounds and it fills us with new hope and new life. You call us to, to follow you with our whole hearts, with all our mind, soul, body, and strength. And so today, Lord, just like those young people that were baptized on Wednesday, we commit our lives to you. And we pray that we will be buried with you and raised to walk in a new life with you starting today. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. He's for you, he's for you, he's for you, he's for you, he's for you. Ah. 